I'm sure you'll have a few viewers from here. All right. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Coach Luciana, right? Is that how you say it, sir? Luciani. Luciani. How you doing? Yeah. Good. How you doing, brother? Good, man. Hey, we're going to just power through this. We got a couple more speakers. We're going to finish strong. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you – where'd you go to? There you are. I'm going to go ahead and give you uh, – Hosting power, sir. Go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit and what you're going to talk about. Basically, run a no huddle and how to communicate it and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, take over. Cool. So, uh, like Coach said, uh, we'll go over no huddle, how we communicate it, why I started doing the no huddle, and things I've learned along the way. I'll show. Uh, like three or four or five different plays. I won't get into like details for the plays. Just I'll show you the play, how we signal it in and some video to go along with those. Um, I coach at the junior high up here in Tillamook, Oregon, out on the coast, small town. And then we have club team where I do the high school stuff. And then we have, we work from third grade all the way up through high school. So I prefer, I like doing the junior high and the, the specifically like the eighth grade freshman type stuff because that's when I started getting in more trouble. Football kind of kept me out of it. So kind of a soft spot, try to keep kids playing the game. That seems to be where there's a lot of drop off between that uh, junior high and high school age group. But I will go ahead and get started. I don't really, well, just like you said, get through this. What, uh, what specifically? Cause I know, cause <laughs> Well, I know with uh, Costa, when I was coaching at Kennedy, we would have kids, like really good football players. And, and I mean, and they'd be like, well, I'm a wide receiver and I didn't have a thousand yards receiving this year. I'm going to quit. Like, so when you talk about that drop off, like what, what are some of the specific things you could probably even talk about as you're, as you're presenting um, to help keep those kids around? Okay, so I think personally a lot of kids get, um, I don't think abused is the right word, maybe taken advantage of like some of the coaches. I mean, your star players, the coaches just kind of use them and uh, abuse them instead of getting to know the kids, mm. if that makes sense. Um, yeah. They just want the production out of them versus getting to know the kid. So by the time they get to the high school, they're just kind of, they're over it. That's a big part. That's what I think. I don't know. I could that's kind of what you have noticed a lot of. Yeah. Um, and then and there's just sides that have been maybe parents have pushed them to play and they don't, you know, really want to be there. But I think if the kids have shown up to practice every day, obviously they want to be there. Right. So I'm just trying to make it fun and keep those guys around. Um, I think seeing the high school coaches, the programs that you're feeding into, if they come to your practices, that helps a lot too. Mm -hmm. It's kind of odd to me when I used to coach down in Reno, like we were involved all the way down from like kindergarten all the way through varsity. And so we didn't really have a lot of fall off, but now I see it where there's, you know, they have a different coach every year. One guy coaches, another guy comes in and they don't see the high school coach until, you know, sophomore year. Yeah. It's kind of odd to me, but, um, okay. So like I said, coach Lucci, uh, head coach at Tillamook junior high, you guys can see that screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, also head coach for the Oregon all state games, which is they take players from all over Oregon. They do, they put up a Portland team versus the rest of Oregon. Uh, they do that from sixth grade up to 10th grade. Um, head coach for the PAC Alpha's Premier Athletic Club. I'm also the AD for Premier Athletic Club. And then I OC for another club that where they go to Ohio. And then I have the Battle Ready Athletics where we just try to raise basically uh, football IQ for the kids. And we basically use that, whatever funds that the kids pay for that, we just roll over for like the traveling team type of stuff. It's not like anything to get rich of. It's just 
basically a way to fundraise and the school doesn't have control of the money. We can use it for whatever. Nice. Um, my email's there. I'll have another slide at the end. Um, my phone number, Twitter for myself and for the Premier Athletic Club. So how this all came about, I was DC for a long time and I signaled in all my plays and was very quick about it. Like we would have stuff signaled in usually before the offense broke the huddle and then we would make our little adjustments afterwards, whatever. Um, I was always watching our offensive coordinator sending in a kid with the next play or having to yell a number to the QB, you know, to match up the wristband type of stuff. When I first started calling offense, that's all I'd really seen. That's how our coach did it in high school. So that's kind of what I did. Moving up here to Oregon, our guys aren't the biggest, but they're fast. So I knew I had to come up with a way to take advantage of that. So I just took what I had done on defense and applied it to the offensive side of the ball. That makes sense. So this first clip is just an example of this is a team that we are playing. This kid, this guy, the uh, quarterback had to run basically 25 yards to the sideline to get the play and then run <coughs> to the huddle. So you can see the quarterback running over to coach to get the play. And running back. So that's the type of stuff we're trying to avoid. You can see our defense is getting rest right now. I mean, that's almost like a full timeout or, you know, timeout for these guys. Sorry. Okay. So things I've learned along the way limit the terminology. And the ways to do that are um, so if you guys are signaling in, plays defensively try to use those same hand signals and apply them to offense if you can or same terminology and apply it to offense so for an example um, if our defensive coordinator wanted to slant inside he calls indy and he has a hand signal for that so if i want to run inside zone i use that same hand signal and that comes in handy because you know you have your stud players are going to play both ways a lot of the time especially for smaller schools. So that's less things that the kids have to learn. It goes back to just simplifying it. Um, if you want, you know, your mic to attack, say blitz an A-gap, whatever terminology you're using for that A-gap, we would use that same terminology if we were doing like a gap run through A-gap. Uh, repeat, repeat, repeat. So every chance you get, just go over your signals with the kids. Um, so we use the hand signals as often as possible. We, um, if they're doing like their first step, the line, and they're doing first steps to the left, uh, the line coach that's over there, he's holding up the signals for, you know, outside run to the left or inside run left, whatever they're working at that time. Uh, you use it during your team period, obviously. We even do it on the bus rides. We do it in the hallways at school. So we'll be walking down the hallway and you see a player and you hold up a sign and they'll yell it out. They'll be, you know, yelling organ or left, right, whatever the hand signal that's being thrown up at them, they'll, and they do it to each other down the hallway. Uh, video, a way to use video is we attach clips of the play call with the signals in the huddle playbook or whatever you're using for your playbook. So you know how you can attach clips of the play being ran, we do that, but we also do attach the clips of the hand signals, which I'll show you guys. Uh, keep it simple. So we limit our formations, the plays and the blocking schemes, especially just starting off. So like our, our third and fourth, they'll learn the formations, fifth and sixth, they'll start getting it signaled into them and they'll learn that stuff all the way up. And as they learn, obviously you can build off of it. But when you're first starting it, we just limit everything. I mean, we have even like our eighth grade and freshmen, they probably run like three or four formations with I don't know seven or eight plays but they're they're good at it they're effective and they're quick uh, conditioning is also a big part especially if you have guys going 
both ways. And so we don't do really a conditioning period, but we make sure there's no walking in between uh, segments. So they, uh, when we're doing team period or indies, there's not a lot of standing around. There's, uh, they're spread out. So they're getting more and more reps versus standing in a line, taking a rep. We're trying to condition them throughout the practice instead of having to do a conditioning period. And if you do it right and your practices are planned, um, that's not really an issue. And you actually end up getting a few more minutes instead of just having kids run or condition at the end of practice. We will once a week, uh, usually like on Wednesdays or something, we will do like a 20 minute conditioning period. And we let the kids know if you're missing out on conditioning or you miss that Wednesday practice for whatever reason, it better be excused and be a good reason. Because if you're trying to miss out on conditioning practices, uh, uh, you know, you're more likely going to be sitting on the bench. And I can't see the question. So if anybody has any questions while I'm doing this, go ahead and uh, go ahead and butt in, Mark. Yeah, um, we teach. Like if you have any questions. All right. Um, we teach concepts, not really routes. So we don't, we have a route tree, but we don't use that in our play calls. We teach concepts so that way it's easier if a player goes down, if our slot receiver goes down or we need to sub somebody in, they know like a smash concept. They know number one's got the hitch, number two's got a corner. So once they learn that, it goes a lot faster. They seem to have a better understanding of it instead of just running a, a hitch in a corner. And then it helps. I try to get, instead of my number one receiver going against another one DB and it being like a 50-50 chance, I want to put my number one receiver against the worst defender and let him just ball out. So if they know the concepts, you can basically move your guys anywhere on the field into any of the positions. Um, yeah, so it helps when you have to move players around or motion receivers. here so now we'll hop into the plays and how we signal them hey, like coach, i said i'm only gonna question real quick do you adjust yeah. signals to prevent against other teams picking up on the signals that's from coach uh, pender no i'm um, kind of like we discussed last night we feel like we go fast enough that if you're stealing if you see our signal and you've decoded it or stole the signal and you can signal it into your defense and get your defense set we're obviously not going fast enough. Right. So you just, you're just coaching your kids to get the signal, boom, and go. Yeah. And you'll see it like when the whistle's blown, they're, we don't even have them really get the ball to the ref. They just set the ball down and they're walking back to the line and they're looking at to the sideline to get the play. So they're getting the play like as they're getting back to the line of scrimmage. Gotcha. Um, so we'll start. Um, here's a way we keep it simple. So our smash, nobody's routes ever change and nobody's. So our X receiver is always on the single receiver side and he is always on the line. So if we're in lips, which is trips left for us, X knows he's on the single receiver side and he is always on the line. F is always off the line and closest to the quarterback in trips. And our, so in our F is, I know a lot of people call this H or the T, that's what our high school calls them. So that's what we go with. We try to keep the terminology the same for the high school. Hey coach, um, you got another question from coach uh, Doc. If you want to um, unmute these guys and then they can even chime in if they want, but he was asking, uh, do all the kids look or do they yell or do they yell in addition? Like, when they get the play every uh every kid every player is looking so every player knows every hand signal okay and like i said we don't have a lot so they're not um there's not I a lot for them to have a lot to, yeah i'm trying to figure out how to unmute everybody sorry oh that's okay i think if you go down to the bottom it uh some and there's something i think it gives you a more option the bottom where it has all the participants Gives you a more okay, option, and then um, if not, don't even worry about it. Yeah, I'll me. just yeah, I'll just have you ask you them. Sorry, ask guys. And I'll, I'll 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 ask you when they come in. Cool. <laughs> All right, so back to it. Um, 
Z is always our outside receiver in trips and always off the line. So here we have the smash concept. We always teach, so this never changes. That's their concept. These guys' routes never change. You can see white uh, F has the option route here based on uh, coverage. So his, no matter where he's at on the field, he has that same route. Uh, same thing with X, he always has that option route in smash. And then our H or our running back, he'll always go opposite of the concept in this particular play and that never changes. So here's how we have it on our huddle is uh, this is not smash. This is our inside run, inside zone. So it's called shoot L, Indy L. And so here's the play in huddle. They have the clip below where they can click on it, watch the play call, and this is what they'll see. And so that's what they'll get. And so we use um, shoot like the guns for shoot. Um, we do the arms up like I forget what the other coach was. So basically like your, uh, you would use for strong or weak is what we use for left or right. So when the arms are up, it forms that L. So that's how they tell the direction. Mm. If our line so we, that's all we really use is uh, Indy inside zone and outside zone for run. So they know if they don't see Indy or Oregon, they are pass blocking. So we don't really have anything too much to signal run or pass. We keep it pretty simple. So that's our shoot, our uh, offset shotgun. Uh, we'll, play that. we'll play that one more time. And we ended up adding another uh, L at the end of that because the line coach said the line was having a problem uh, knowing which way to block. So I just threw an extra uh, arms up there at the end. So this is uh, in a game, me calling that shoot left, Indy left. So that's how quick the play call is. You can see this is after the play is over. Receivers are looking as he's walking back. And they're ready to go. And they'll let you know, they'll look at you. If they didn't catch it, they'll just give you, you know, a hand signal or something, run it back to me real quick and you just run it back to them. Okay, we've got... Okay, so here's how we would call outside run to the right. So we're gonna go shoot left again, and then Oregon, which is outside run to the right. So you throw up the O for Oregon, and then the arms down makes that lowercase r on uh, the, uh, what is that, the left side of the body. I'll play that one more time. And then some of these videos don't have the clap at the end, but that's how we signify that the uh, plays are all done being called in or signaled in, is all just clap at the end and they know that the signal is over. Okay, rips. So this is the outside run to the right again, but it's out of trips. So rips is what we call trips right. L is our uh, running back to the left, and then Oregon is outside, and R is right. So here we just do rips uh, like Superman, ripping the chest uh, like Cam Newton did, did, does. I don't know if he's even playing anymore. What he's doing is not quite playing, but he's still right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll play that uh, one more time. And there we go. 
like that. So now we'll uh, trips left, smash. So lips is trips left. L once again is the running back and then smash is the concept. Uh, you can see once again, like we talked about, F still has that option route. X has his option route on the single receiver side. So nothing, nothing has changed for them. They would do the same thing out of two by two or if it was out of rips. And then here's one more concept that um, just to show how just a different signal. Um, it's out of two by two. So that's back to shoot, right? And then shallow is the concept. <coughs> and we just came up with shallow, like uh, the water's waist high, I guess, is what the kids came up with. So, and you've got to be careful there because sometimes the kids will come up with some stuff and you're like, yeah, we can't be doing that out there on the field. <laughs> it's all good to joke around and practice, but yeah, there's, right. yeah, we, uh, we were doing that all-star game and the kids wanted to run. Basically, we were going to move the tight end over and make our, uh, our tackle an eligible receiver. And I'm like, well, what do you guys want to call it? They're like, let's call it Trojan. I'm like, all right, cool. We can do that. How do you guys want to signal it in? Mm -hmm. And some of the signals that they were giving me, I'm like, yeah, I cannot be out on the field. doing. Yeah, that. no, that, that, that doesn't go. Not today. <laughs> I was thinking Trojan, you know, like the horse, like the sneak, right, like, like, like the condom. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not going to be out there. Like I'm trying to put, we go history on, and they go to the con. Right. Um, okay. So once you get this down with the simple stuff, this is the biggest problem that we'll run into is the refs not keeping up. So I'll show you just an example. And this video right here is kind of shaky. I just uh, took some off of one of the Facebook pages for today. So ball is out of bounds. You can see the refs already kind of gassed, walking it back. Then he'll spot the ball. Eventually, then he stands over it. And we're, we're all ready. I mean, we're good to go. He's like, let's go. So as soon as he backs away, we can snap the ball and go. But, you know, if your refs are getting tired, the defense is probably getting tired as well. And you can see the size difference in some of these Kentucky guys versus us. And so these guys – I mean, if you could run it right and you can do it quick, you'll start gassing out your opponents pretty quick. Okay, so once you've got that down and you're moving to the point where the refs are slowing down and out of breath type of deal is when we can start tagging things. Um, so motions, we can signal in motions. Um, our motions can be added to almost any play without much changing. Um, fly is our F in motion, which was that slot. And then zip is our Z in motion, which was, uh, that number one receiver, a hard count. We have a signal for hard count, which I don't think I included a video for, but when we want to hard count it, I just knock on my head and that's what we use for hard count. Um, we always go on one, but we'll mix that hard count in. So the snap count never changes. It's always on one unless they get that hard count. Uh, the wide receivers and the routes, how we tag those. Receivers can be tagged at any time. So if we've called a concept and we see something we like better, obviously. Um, all receivers have a different hand signal. So that includes our X, F, Y, and Z. For our X, I just put the arms up in the X. F was the tricky one. I just do the hands together like you're warming them by the fire. Y, we go up like you're doing YMCA. And Z, uh, I do the arms up right here across, forms that Z. Most of our routes also have signals, at least the routes that um, 
we want to tag. We would just yell, say we had called all verts. We would just yell check from the sideline, give the signal for whatever wi uh, wide out that we want to change his route. So we would just say X and then uh, post. And I have video for that as well in here. So here's our motions with that fly motion. So we'd start out a two by two, uh, running back once again, going opposite of the concept. But when we call fly, F still has that same option route here. He goes in motion. Once he clears, he's just got that option route on the other side. Uh, so here's how we would call shoot L fly smash. So we just do arms out to the side like a kid pretending is, he's an airplane. Shoot L, fly is the motion, smash is the concept. Okay, the zip motion. Uh, so we would go shoot R, smash L. And so here's another thing that we do. So this play, I just ended up clipping out of, it looks like out of our seven on seven playbook. But this is how often we run this stuff. So even during the tackle season, when we do our seven on seven, we run the same playbook. So they're learning this hand signal all, even in the off season when we're doing sevens. So we have our, uh, our school team and then I have the club team, but our club team is just our, our kids from our school because I, we can't have them during the off season. So the club. We can't coach them during the off season. So we have the club and we have kids or coaches that are not associated with the school coaching them and they run our playbook. So just a workaround, I guess. Uh, so ace, they called it ace just because instead of shoot, the uh, halfback is behind the quarterback. Uh, the seven on seven, we wouldn't signal in there. That's just to represent to the coaches that it's for seven on seven. So it'd be ace, zip, smash. Um, so this is the one thing that does change. This is why we teach the concepts. So Z and smash would normally have this hitch, but to keep the concept, we have the running back come out here and set up. Z goes in motion and he takes the run. They basically just switch routes. This play is awesome, especially against man coverage. So ace, zip, smash. So we just hold up the one finger for ace, zip like you're zipping up your jacket, and then smash is the concept. Are we still good? Any questions yet? No, no, we're good. Cool. So uh, we'll go ace six. Here's how we'll uh, tag some of our receivers. So six is uh, your four verts. In this example, we'll tag uh, Z down here with a post and Y with a whip. So we would line up and if we saw something that we wanted to change, we would just yell check, check from the sideline. And then we would give the signal for Z and what route we want him to run. And then we'd give the signal for why and what route we want him to run. And the quarterback, everybody knows all these signals. So even if our quarterback saw something that maybe we didn't, the, our quarterback has power. He could change, you know, he could call it from the line. So this one on the left is uh, changing Z to the post. And so we just do the arm straight up like the goalpost. And then Y, uh, whip. Just like you're cracking a whip. Uh, 
let's see what we got here. Okay, so this here is just uh, two plays called back to back, just so you can kind of see, uh, I guess, the pace of it. I wish those receivers would get to the line a little bit quicker. So we have the slant there, the tackle, and now the play is already being called in. These guys should be looking, but they're too busy celebrating the slant. So those are the two plays that clips 41 seconds long. So that's, you know, two plays in 41 seconds. If the guys are paying attention instead of celebrating, you knock probably about 10 to 15 seconds off of that between them sprinting to the line and instead of celebrating, just getting lined up. Let's see what this one is. I'm not sure what this one is. Sorry. So I think this is a clip of uh, we don't really change our pace. So at this point in the game, it's about four minutes left in the fourth quarter. And we're up 18 to zero. And I'm not going to play this whole clip because I think it's like three minutes long. Yeah. But we don't really change our pace. All we really do is tell the kids uh, stay in bounds, but we'll still throw. We still run. We still go no huddle even with a lead and trying to – because we feel we run no huddle all the time. We don't want to change something up in the last couple minutes. Now, this guy should have stayed in bounds. Once again, everybody's celebrating instead of getting the play called. And you can see the linemen are ready. Center gave us a call. He didn't get the play. And we end up taking this drive all the way down. You can see the signals I'm here on the bottom or the left of the screen calling it in. But we don't, uh, we don't stop. We don't. The only time we huddle is to start a drive. So here's that shoot right, indie right. So this would be an inside run to the right. And this team here was made up of kids from all over Oregon that we took to Ohio. And they had, I don't know, about eight practices before we went out there. So, I mean, it, this can be installed pretty quickly. We do it with that all-state team. We have three days, and we get it installed. We just start – I mean, we obviously just keep it really simple. But I think that's First, all I've got. Like, uh, when you talk about um, – when you talk about um, being able to install, you know, with a bunch of kids in a really short period of time, do you have, like, a, a, a practice plan uh, that you consistently use over and over that makes sure that these kids pick it up so quickly? I do. So I have, I mean, just my regular install schedule, like I would for uh, incoming players at the younger level. And so what I'll do is I'll have our starters up and I stand in front when we're doing just uh, like on air type stuff. I stand in front, like where your safety would be or something. And that's where I signal the play from. So I'll call and I use the words 
and we go through it and they'll run for about 10 yards to where I'm at. And then the second string guys will come up and run the play right behind them. Now in okay. that situation, not everybody's going to be some, so that second group might only have four or five guys in it, but they're still running through the same motions. And mm -hmm. we do that and we run. So for like seven minutes straight, we'll do nothing but smash concept. And so we'll run for seven minutes, uh, smash, we'll run it out of trips, we'll run it out of, so lips, rips, and we'll run it out of two by two. Just and we'll, Yep, just for seven minutes straight. And that's what we use our conditioning for. And so if we don't have enough guys to do two groups, they know they're sprinting for that 10 yards. And I could make them just turn around and run it back the other way, but I them sprint back to where the ball would be, like it's an incomplete pass. And I make them run it again. Nice. And then we'll do the same thing uh, with the next concept. So you could do basically in a half hour period, we work three different concepts out of three or four different formations. Um, I think that's about the end of my stuff, to be honest with you. Cool. Um, there's my, oh, yeah, there's your info. Cool. Awesome. And then I'll have, I have like a lot more. So if cool. anybody has any questions, I have like full playbook stuff. I just don't want to go through the full playbook on here because I knew there was. Well, I so figure I there's going to be a, a quick lot of people, there's going to be a lot of people interested in stuff. So we might, we might just have a small segment, just, you know what I'm saying? Just you on the Facebook page with the, with the group and stuff like that with, with all these coaches. Cause it's kind of what I want to do is just get a little bit of this stuff out and then, whatever these guys want us to expand on, we bring those coaches on and expand on it and have another one of these, you know what I'm saying? And then you can really dive into your playbook and really dive into how you drill your kids at practice and, and how you really go through what you do, what you just talked about. Right. Yeah. And it's uh, the biggest part of it is just keep it simple. And it really helps if you have that vertical alignment for like you high school coaches, if you can get your feeder programs to buy into it, it just having them even just using your terminology is huge. So by the time they get to you at high school and all, if all they had to learn to you by the time they got to high school was your hand signals and then your tags, you know, and then your varsity level stuff. Right. Well, it's the language, right? You're just building right. just like you learn your ABCs in kindergarten or whatever, and you build on it. Yep. Cool. Awesome coach. Thank you so much. There's uh, all this information. And that'll be up on the face. We'll get that up on the Facebook page as well. Um, go ahead and hand over uh, hosting duties, sir. And then we will get Coach Ramsey on here. I've heard a lot about him. I've heard a lot of great things about him. I haven't been able to experience his uh, any of his talks, but I've heard a lot of good things about him from other other coaches that I've been talking to. So, um, you know, we're going to go ahead and – oop. We're going to go ahead and bring on Coach Ramsey. Yep, he is good to go. All right, Coach, I'm going to go ahead and hand over hosting duties to you, and it's all yours, sir. Awesome. <clears throat> well, I know that uh, I was on earlier, and there was 50 cats on here, and it looks like I'm the grinder guy tonight. We got the guys right, who really I love know. football. At this <laughs> you, know what the, you know what I've learned here is that – as, as much as we all want to talk, is that we need to – I need to do, like, four speakers next time and then just keep it because we, cause we did. We had about 50 guys originally, and then, I mean, we're getting 730 now, so – and it's on a Saturday. Sure. Uh, coach is still oh, – never mind. I thought – All right. Yeah. My screen now. Yep. Okay. Awesome. So um, I'm sharing that screen so you can't see my face or whatever, but that's that's fine. Um, so um, coach asked me to, or I, I asked coach, you know, what did you, what did you guys need? And uh, he said we're going to speak on the zone. I told him I could speak for like three days on the zone, but I guess if you're starting it. 9:35 in Central Time, then probably don't need to speak for three days straight. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to shorten this up. But I know that we talked about scheme, and I'll I'll draw a couple of things up, and you can see them. I've got some film, um, and I'll try to uh, 
to go as quick as I can, but I, I wanted to show you drills in terms of how we teach. We're, we're not a four hands, four eyes group. Um, I've been coaching for 20 years, 20 plus years, uh, most of it at the high school level, um, one at the college level. And uh, what I have found or what, what you, uh, most of you guys will know, or if you haven't learned it by now, is that when you're, when you're coaching a group of kids high school wise, there's some in your public settings, um, they're the kids that you got. There's no recruiting in terms of this uh, scenario. So you're going to coach. Uh, a, a, we've tried to coach a scheme for a number of years that uh, that is actable, that is it is um, it is uh, effective, and that it's simple, and that it uh, it works for guys that are five nine one ninety seven or six four two eighty. And I've had all the different uh, scenarios of kids that are between those, including this year where I've got a left tackle that was that way, and then we had. Uh, right tackles who were the who were the opposite. Their you know left tackle was six four two eighty five and right tackle was not <laughs> five nine and two twenty. Um, and so and playing playing five A football in Texas or six A football in Texas, we've done it. I've, we've used this scheme everywhere from two A to to six A here. Uh, when we're talking about the zone and we're talking about inside zone. Um, we can talk about both. I don't know that I've got enough time to do both of that and, and maintain as many guys as we got. But I would say this, that we, we don't teach four hands, four eyes, because um, in terms of create, when you, when you say zone, we preach that we have and we are responsible for a zone. Um, if that is the case and we're running to that zone, then we can't play pinball. This is just my philosophy. It's the way we work, and it's worked for me. Um, we go at 45-degree angles. We take steps at 45-degree angles. We believe really strongly in the first and second steps. Um, in terms of where they go. And so we work those uh, consistently. Um, so when we're going to teach 45 degree angles, we're also going to teach uh, that we are responsible for everything in our, what we call fat tracks. And the reason we call it that or elephant tracks is because, you know, early on when you would teach offensive linemen how to block and stay with their hips low and, and work with their hips low, they called it a duck walk. Well, I ain't never seen anybody that's afraid of a duck unless you're playing against Oregon, I guess, but Ducks don't seem very vicious. So we used it as elephant steps. We, we changed it to elephant steps also for mental picture. Like we try to draw as many pictures as possible in our kids' heads as to what it is um, we want them to do. And if they're 5'9", five, five, 197 pounds playing offensive line and trying to block a dude that's, that's 260 on the other side, they have to have a mentality that they are uh, 6'4", 280 or an elephant. Um, also an elephant when they – step they kind of step real staccato they're not fred flintstone with typically their insteps which is toes and heels at the same time so if they're doing that um, that's that's not necessarily a duck either um, we're trying to dig them in uh, staccato and pound the ground and you should feel it if you're the coach at the front of this drill um, now this is our our offensive line coach currently at brenham this is our assistant offensive line coach um, in the drill and so what we're looking for is happy feet when you look at this drill you should see this and it should look uh, very similar across the board. And any guy that steps wrong, you can pretty much see it because the uniformity of all the guys stepping, um, you can you can tell where it is they're going. And if a guy goes in the wrong direction or steps too far inside of himself, you can see it pretty clearly because he's the oddball out um, when all these guys are lined up. So what we're going to do is um, when we're drilling this, we're going to drill it uh, where we're, we, we work from three-point stances. We believe that we're quicker where we need to get. Um, we try to, to uh, work on our stances where that hand – going to be out in far, as far in front of us as possible without putting any weight on it, um, any noticeable weight on it. If I can kick the hand out from underneath you and you fall forward, you're not in a good stance. And that way we don't hide um, or we don't um, have an issue where we give away run versus giving away pass in our stance. So we start in this drill, um, and I'm going to try to get it to go slow. I say slow-mo, but it's only one or two steps at a time. So I'm going to play this and we'll see where we get to. There's our one step. We cock our guns. We cock our guns. We go to what we call the titty holsters. Which anytime you talk about things like that in front of kids, they laugh and goof off, but they remember exactly what it is you're talking about because you don't want to put them. Um, you don't want to put those guns in the holsters by your hips, or the defensive lineman will be in your chest before you know it. Um, so we we want to put our, our uh, hands in our titty holsters when we're cocking the guns on the first step, second step, punching. As you can see in the midst of this drill. Um, some of these guys are punching and they should recoil is what should happen if they're doing it correctly. So we'll kind of, let's see if we rewind this drill and we caught this a little late on the tape. So I'm going to go to the next uh, repetition. There we go. So we're going full. So what happened in these three repetitions? The first one, um, we're taking that first step. Uh, we're punching. 
we should still record, but we're, we're only taking one step. So we'll look at this in one step. There's one step. So then the next drill we go to, we caught this a little late on the film, um, but this is two steps. And you notice, you, you can see that this guy is quite obviously wrong where he's stepping. He's stepping wide as I'll get out. We teach 45 degree steps. We also teach six inch steps. You can see that this guy's hips are too high. When you're standing there, you can see all of this happen um, around all of these cats. Can y'all see where my cursor is going? So yeah, I'm not just pointing to random spaces and talking. Yeah, like on I here. Can, yeah. Okay. Um, so in the back, you can see this kid's hips are too high. This kid's hips are too high. The big tight, the big guard right here's hips are way too high. Um, the front line's pretty decent. Um, they were what were our projected starters at the beginning of the year, but we, we had some shifts go around. But you notice there's your 6'4", 280 cat. And there's your 5'10", probably, he's probably 240 or 250 because he's a strong built kid. But, but um, again, I've had guys that were literally 5'9", 197, play on 6'8 football in Texas. Anyway, so there was the two steps. So you go one step, you come back and go two steps, and then you come back and the front row is going to go full. We're going to go five yards. Normally I have a coach that stands about here so that that centers at a 45 and at that point. But – the tackle is really the point of the drill. So coach should stand here or he should stand here, which is a 45 for that tackle. And once that tackle sets the pace of wherever this is going, what we try to do is get these kiddos to visualize making this wall move according to where he's going so that we have no big gaps that happen. So wherever we start, ideally we'd like to be 18 inches to two foot splits um, that kind of create uh, some good gaps for us. There's been times where we've been at six, Six splits at one spot and two foot splits at another, and that's based on the kid's individual ability. Um, no, no two kids are alike, but this scheme works together if you work the kid's strengths um, individually. And I know that sounds like it's complicated, but it's really not. Obviously, we're teaching all these kids, and this is just you know, 14 of them. There are times where we have 30 of them at a time, so we've got the JV line going at the same time, and you can, you can teach the drill where 30 kids are going. And nobody's standing around. We're not watching stuff. And the kids that are in the back tend to be uh, the less experienced kids so they can watch what's happening in the cats in front of them and learn. Um, and we think that that's really important in terms of trying to get our stuff taught correctly. Uh, but in the third rep, so you go one step, two step. The third rep, the front row is going to go full. They're going to go for about five yards. They're going to go at 45, and they're going to try to keep uh, pounding, those hand, pounding those feet in the ground, but they're going to try to keep the distance that they have when they started in these first two steps. So if he widens and his step takes him wider, then these guys would start at 45 and then we would hope that they would widen as well. And then he might start at 45 and then he might widen as well so that the wall moves as one unit. We don't work a lot. Um, we don't call them double teams. Let's put it that way. Um, so we don't work. We're not going to pound and, and figure out whether we're supposed to pound this four eye with these two, with the garden tackle, or whether we're supposed to work out to that four eye and then work out to the back, or we don't do that. We're going to work on this 45 unless we get some kind of threat that says he's going to blitz off this edge and be a C-gap only defender. We might call the out then, and then everybody is going to adjust their steps accordingly um, and then work to keep the, the distance between each other, if that makes sense. Um, ideally, let me erase all of this stuff off of here this weekend see what it is we're talking about. Ideally, we're responsible for a 45 degree track from the shoulder tip, from the shoulder pad tip to the other shoulder pad tip of our shoulder pads. So we are responsible for everything in here if I'm the center. And if all 11 dudes on the defense lined up in here, he's responsible for all of them. Now, I ain't going to do that, obviously. But if they were, that's his responsibility. We also use an analogy where we talk to the kids about bread versus cheeseburger. And what that means is if mama gives you a dollar and says, I need a loaf of bread and I need it in the next 10 minutes, all of you are going to hustle your butt off to the store, to the stores closest to you, grab that loaf of bread and get your butt back to your mama. That's your bread. That's your responsibility. That's so instead of rules, um, instead of blocking schemes where you say, I got that guy, we're blocking zones. Um, and so if there is something in our zone, that means he is in our bread. He is in the place where I have to take care of that, that scenario first in terms of blocking somebody before I do anything else. If we're not, if, we, if we've got the dollar from Mamba, but she says, hey, you know what? I just need it by the end of the day. And you've got an extra five bucks. 
here in Texas, we eat at Whataburger and you want the double meat with cheese. So if you want the double meat with cheese and you got time, you would go get the double meat with cheese, then go get the bread, then you can bring it back to mom. In that case, we're blocking, um, we would be blocking, say we're going zone to the right, which we are in this case. If we had a nose here, then we obviously have bread. We have responsibility to our play side that we must take care of before we can do anything else. If he were not there, if he were going again, zone to the right for these guys, he has nothing in this zone. So he's got time and he's going to use what we call a punch drag, which means he's going to punch straight forward in this area, not fully locked out. And he's going to try to drag that cat with him on his 45 this direction. The left guard obviously has bread then. So he is working this as if he has no help. Um, and he's going to work cock guns, punch, um, and he's going to work where he's going to drive block that cat. Basically, it's a base block for where he's at. Wide base, six-inch steps, short and quick, uh, low leverage. Uh, we talk about you having jet plane takeoffs and not helicopter takeoffs, which just means that our hips are underneath where it is we're going um, until it's time to get risen uh, and sprint that guy into a, into a pancake. Are there any questions so far? Any questions, guys? Nope. I think we're good. Cool. So we work 45. Go ahead. Yeah, no, we're good. Go ahead. Okay, good. So we work 45 degree angles on our zone. Then you watch this is this drill. They're going to go. The front row is going to go. They're going to go full now. And everybody else. Now they may all go full. Our O line coach, I kind of give them some leeway, but. Should be running here. Maybe. I kind of live on the edge of the internet connection world out here in the country a little bit. So there we go, go ahead in slow motion. Okay, so everybody's doing full. Now what you'll notice about this drill, this was early in camp. We don't have pads on because we can't have pads on yet. And every single one of these suckers is a helicopter plane takeoff. Even the big boy who's got D1 offers it's just way too high. It's not good. It's not what I would accept. What you notice here, the gray shirt kid who at first started off as maybe a JV guy showed himself a little bit. Um, and he's got maybe the best hip position of all of them. They've got wide bases. Uh, you can't practice this enough. What will happen eventually, and I really appreciated Dwayne's um, presentation earlier in terms of uh, what it is you're looking for and how it is you're coaching. And it's got to do with your relationships with kids with regard to them trying to please you um, because you're dynamic and because you get to know them because you know things that are going on outside their lives is that they'll cheat the drill to try to get the result because everything about society preaches result except for football, um, except for those who preach process. And you got, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm more of a Dabo Sweeney fan than I am necessarily an Nick Saban fan, although I'm an Alabama fan, but He's preached process for God knows how long. And, and the fact is that you got to fall in love with the process. The way we preach it here is you got to embrace the suck. You got to fall in love with boredom. Um, because in order to get better at anything, it takes repetitions and it takes positive, solid, correct repetitions to get better at them. Um, now, you, you want to reach though, because if you can fail with the, with the intent of learning, that's the only, that's the best way to learn. It's the best teacher uh, on the planet. Um, so anyway, hip position for all of these guys is way too high. Um, it should be lower. They should be digging them in. Um, you see, this is flopping around. This is more duck step than, uh, than elephant step. If you watch it as we're going, I'm gonna go back and run this uh, back again, just so we can point out some of the negatives and the things that you look for as you're getting through this. I, I can tell you that if I'm running this drill, the first two steps, I want to send them back. We start again because we're, we're so many things wrong. Um, one, I got resting on an elbow here. That makes me slower. If the NFL didn't think it was important, they wouldn't do studies on it. If you're resting on your elbow, it slows you down. It's split-second timing, and we can't afford to be slow. We're already playing on offensive line. There's another one right there resting on his elbow. Too wide a stance because I can tell you right now this kid is not six foot four. Notice the difference in his stance here versus the stance on the kid that's actually 6'5". Way too wide. This ain't bad from a center because I know how tall he is. And he works, we have a tendency, all kids have a tendency to step inside themselves regardless of the scenario, if they're gonna base block somebody. So if I start with a wide, lazy, fat lineman stance, right? So let's look at this left guard, for instance, or this left guard for that matter. If that stance starts there, when I start to move, my first step 
instead of being there, my foot will end up actually backwards and into the stance, which means I have lost ground toward the target that I'm trying to get to. That's not acceptable and it will get you beat. Um, so when we step, we are looking for the six inch step forward at a 45 more like this. And I know that seems like, coach, you splitting hairs. I'm not splitting hairs if this guy is freaking Frankenstein, which he is in the way that he moves. So if I'm trying to make a kid unathletic, who is unathletic, athletic. If I'm trying to make a kid who does not react well naturally because he's not as athletic as others, be able to react well to what happens in front of him, I must be a stickler for small things like this because there are no little things. There are no little things. If you're teaching it, it's important enough for you to teach it. And there's no such thing as a little thing because if you stack it on day one here in August when we started this, then last night when we're playing for, for our lives and fighting for our lives and the second play of the game is zone um, in a variation of zone and we don't take this step and we're behind that nose guard because for the last 1,630 reps over the course of those four months, we didn't work on getting this step right, then you're out of the playoffs. And that's what we're sitting at right now. So um, we, we got to make this guy better. And it's a repetition scenario that you, you set a standard and you hold the standard. And this kid is a want-to guy, so it's not like you can't do what you're asking him to do. Um, and it's a, it's a very simple thing that we're asking him to do. So we want to make sure and keep things simple. Um, I'm kind of going all over the place with this thing, but I, I wanted to make sure that I'm covering all of the bases because it's important for me. You'll see scheme in a minute. Scheme is not difficult. Um, scheme is not uh, complicated. Our schemes are not complicated. The tags aren't complicated. It's just something to remember. But I believe that the how in what we do inside zone and outside zone are the difference in why we can be successful and why, why we've been successful with kids that are, you know, I've got one that's playing at NFL right now that's playing for the Giants and he's playing right tackle. Um, and I've got kids who will play at five foot nine and 197 pounds and, and become great people uh, and citizens because they've learned that little things aren't little things. So that when they go work a job and they put their signature on that job every day, they would resign themselves to a one day contract the next day based on their work level today. Um, and so th this is one of those little things. Um, and so anyways, so this is equal through the drill real quick. Again, we're too high hip wise for sure. Uh, you notice how these feet are flopping on this cat right here. Notice the left guard and watch his feet. More dug in, not flopping the toes around. Um, not trying to gain so much ground. It's not that important. This six five guy, not bad here, but again, everything too high and his first step is way too long. Six inches is six inches for anybody, for everybody, excuse me. And we're men. Or y'all just see the screen. <laughs> y'all see what I'm saying? Yeah. That's six inches. So don't be freaking lying on this sucker. And the, and the boys understand exactly what I'm saying when I say that too. When I say that, I'm going to get a step that's about that long, which is what I want. When I say six inches to let their mind go, I'm going to get a step like this left tackle, which is not correct. It's too long and it gets you in trouble. Um, a lot of times because they take those long steps and they get impatient a little bit, if I've got a nose here, let's say, and we're running zone to the right, then he will look and see that there is a piece of this human all the way over here. Well, that's not anywhere close to his bread. That's stealing the left guard's bread. That's not his problem. He needs to stay in this 45 track so he can pick up what shows up there. If he goes down to this nose, he better make that guy go all the way to here. Otherwise, he's not creating enough space for us to have success against these linebackers that are going to then gap exchange and fill it right there where he should have been. Um, if you're trying to take care of this, another way we preach this is if you're trying to take care of another brother's bread, you can't take care of your own. Um, and so, so uh, when that's the case, you're not doing your job, which means you didn't get your bread home to mama. And you can come back home to mama and tell her mama, but I was trying to help my buddy such and such. Mama don't want to hear that. Mama wants her bread. That's why she gave you the dollar. That's why she gave you the dollar. Um, and so we try to, we just try to reiterate what responsibility is in an era where it may not be getting held, those kids may not be getting held accountable to those things. Um, and so we tie it into life with all that as well. Um, let me see what we got here. I think go to the next drill. Good. So we're already at one step. And what you'll notice here is in the midst of this drill, uh, he started them over real quick. He had them going and there was a couple of guys in the back row who didn't get down. They got to get down quick. That's how we preach our pace. We practice fast, um, but we don't necessarily play fast. Um, 
we have been in a huddle. This group this year didn't really like the huddle process. We didn't ever catch a rhythm where we were in the huddle. Last year, we were in a huddle all the time unless we had a one-word call or unless we needed to go fast to win a game or get to score quickly. Um, but the only way, and this is our belief, is that the only way to go fast in a game is to go fast on the clock. And we can get up to the ball and we can slow the play down that way. Um, but if we are not going fast in practice, you can't do that in a game. Um, so what you'll notice here is we got to spend a lot more time going left side because the dominant foot guys tended, tended to step better. But if you'll watch the steps of these cats, uh, and I don't know, this may be as far. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to go in slow motion. Notice the first steps. Inside himself. Not pointed. He's pointing straight ahead, not 45. Sideways. Too long. Straight ahead. So we got a lot of work to do going to the left side. A lot of work to do. Um, standing straight up in this back row, and I can tell you this, this guy thought he was playing defense only. This guy thought he would be playing defense only. And this guy was a remote learner this year. Um, we had both remote and face-to-face -face learners, and it was, a, it was a booger bear to try to tackle, I can tell you that. Um, so anyway, we'll go to the next uh, drill, which should be to the left again. They didn't catch it. Uh, let's see. We should be going left full here, I believe. Okay, now, so, uh, so we went left full. Any questions on inside zone in terms of just the, what we call a five lines drill? Awesome. Okay, so this one we're going outside zone for us. It's not outside zone, it's stretch. To me, there's a difference. If you're teaching outside zone, we're working just a different aiming point to um, the same side we would be in inside zone. And... Uh, and we're still working double teams and things of that nature, which we wouldn't be doing. When we run stretch, we are going to zone. The first step on the tackle side should be zoning out on whatever he's got. So if he's got a nice tight five, he can take a regular 45-degree step, run zone. And then when we get to him, we're going to push him off to the next level, cut everything off. Everybody here should be, again, cocking guns to TD holsters. Notice this is lazy D1 boy who didn't want to get himself straight right there. We need to get his other hand in his holster here. But the important hand is this hand as we're going to throw what we call a hook. Um, we're not throwing an uppercut and we're not – because we're not trying to – um, we're not trying to run a defensive line rip drill. We're not trying to rip. We are trying to punch to contact with that hook um, to the next man in front of us, wherever he is. We are trying to chase and get to the hip of the man in front of us. We get to his hip. There's no penetration. We got what we want. Um, as we're throwing this, we're going to throw this hook on the, on the, as quickly as we can off the football. We're going to step at as close to lateral as possible, again, trying to gain ground. These are pretty decent steps. Again, this guy tackles running zone. Um, and then everybody else is chasing that cat in front of them. We're trying to get to the hip of the guy in front of us. Uh, and as we're doing that, when we get to where we can square up with our shoulders and our hips, We've thrown that hook to contact, we're locking in, and we're going to chase the V. What do I mean when I say chase the V? Every time that you create contact as an offensive lineman with the defensive tackle lineman, whoever, uh, on the defensive side, get these erased. Every time you do that, uh, you create a V. So, for instance, if this were the defensive lineman we were blocking, this is the V we're trying to attack. So we're trying to hit that with that hook that we just threw with our left hand here, and then we're and then we're trying and we're not going to get there. We're going to get to about back here, which is normally the backside number. What we're going to try to do then is we're going to throw a jab at this to square up on that cat. When we do that, our hips then go into the hips of this cat, push him off, and he's up at a 45 is where we should go. That's what we're aiming for when we run our stretch, and that goes. All, all the way across the board, all the way up the field. So now instead of this wall of humans that we had going here to 45, trying to move the defense that way, let me erase these real quick again. We are going to then now on the stretch, we're going to take this wall of humans, and we're going to try to swing this wall of humans here, or elephants if you may, to there and make the wall there and get outside if we can. When we run our stretch, we have another blocker. He's either going to be here. That's our A. Our A is like Superman. He's got to play a lot of places. He might even start back here, um, but he is still responsible for the first thing off of our butt on this side. There are times we run stretch from that backside all the way. 
There are times when that guy's in the backfield here, and there are times when that guy's a tight end here. But that guy has got the first man outside the tackle. That's his responsibility. Um, the first man in a two-point stance. How about that? That's what his job is. Um, so that's what we teach in terms of the offensive line. So, again, they're going to throw a hook, throw a jab, and then they should be sprinting after that first step gets them going. Uh, you notice this step, too far up in the line, needs to be more toward the hip of the dude in front of him. This is a great step. This is a pretty decent step, but he probably gained a little too much ground. He needs to be back here so he can go directly flat, not losing ground, not gaining ground, or he's going to put himself up here, and then we're going to have penetration between him and the guard. So let me erase all of these, and we'll let this drill play through and see where we get to. We usually work this drill. We'll take one step. We'll take three steps, and then we'll go full. Again, trying to work uh, the importance of those first three steps. And let me just say this to kind of define why it is we do these these couple of things. Number one, if the first step, I know that there are many uh, college guys, college line guys who will teach, or pros for that matter, that they don't care so much about the first step, they care more about the second step. And I understand that in terms of power. Here's the difference. I didn't recruit any of these cats. So there are some that can, but there are some that can't. Particularly guys like this kiddo who runs like Frankenstein, if you ever seen him run a 40, like I don't know how he runs. His knees don't bend. They don't need any hip, hip flow. I don't know. He looks like he's got – he's looked like a sick man. Um, and so uh, so with that being the case, I've got to teach these guys that the first step does mean something. To us, it does. And I, I, would, I would contest that it still means something to those guys who have more athletic ability. Um, it would just make them better. But it maybe it's a statistic that they don't need to search up or they're getting the job done without it. Here's, here's my point. If I'm trying to go to North Dakota – here it is. There's North Dakota, right? Or better yet, because we're running the zone, let's say I'm trying to go to New York. There's New York. Here's my dude. Here's my dude, right? If I take a step here to New York, but I'm trying to go to North Dakota, it does not matter how much effort I have on the face of the planet or off. If I'm hauling balls to New York, I'm going that direction. I will never end up in North Dakota. Never. Because you can go around the earth and back and be in the same circle going that direction. Once you started that path, this is the only place that you're going to go with full effort. If you take this step intending for this step, you must adjust. And it will take an offensive lineman on average three steps to get back to there. Tell me that that is not inefficient and a problem. It is. If your first step puts you in a place that you don't want to go, you're going to have to correct it with some other kind of attribute that you may or may not have. So we don't teach that. I don't want to teach makeup. I want to teach ideal as much as possible. So we worry about the first step. We teach the first step. We talk about the first step as if it is critical. It is also, again, one of those things that there are no little things in life. I can put as much effort as I want to, but if I take the first step in the wrong direction, for instance, if I get a zero in a class because I don't turn it in because I choose not to, for whatever reason, I choose not to turn that in. I can never get 100 in that class, not without some kind of alteration. Either the teacher drops a grade or I go back in and she allows me to make it up, but it's out of my control any longer. I had control at first when I had the choice to turn the grade in. When I took that choice and didn't turn it in, I will never reach 100%. First steps are critical. Um, so second step, we often teach as the power step. So if you don't get it in the ground before the defender gets his, his first step in the ground, because his is going to be a little longer uh, sometimes, or better yet, get it in the ground and your hands ready to defend wherever you're going to have to punch or be aggressive wherever you're going to have to punch, then he's going to have his hands in your chest and the game is over. Um, so first steps and second steps are absolutely critical to me. It's kind of like I uh, taught softball for – 12 years, my sister was an All-American for the University of Alabama, and we worked contact drills from here to the end of time with teaching teams that I taught, and we would double our offensive production because if you can work to contact, the finish just means whether or not you're going to go home run or not. But the bat, bottom line is the bat, what the material it's made out of, the angle that it hits the ball, and the ball's intensity is going to determine how far that ball is going to go and how fast it's going to come off of that bat if you work yourself to the contact point. When you finish and roll away, it may go a little bit more left. It may go a little bit more right. It may go over the fence or it may go on the ground. But in terms of intensity and you hitting the ball, the contact point is the most critical. Again, first and second steps are important. 
I know I'm preaching this thing and you guys are probably looking at your screen going, this guy's a nutcase. It's been what I've, it's been what I have uh, experienced. It works from kids again, from five, nine, one ninety seven to two, to six, five, two eighty kids, guys that are playing in NFL and guys that are never see a snap on a high school football field can ac accomplish this and get it done against people who are better than them. Um, and it works. So uh, that's our stretch. That's our inside zone. Um, I, I don't even know what time it is or when we started or anything like that. I've, I've got um, schematically, I can draw it up. Or I can show you some film of some, some inside zone variations. Coach kind of give me a little, little direction here for five more minutes, I guess. You know, what, Coach, you um, I don't know. We'll, we'll, uh, go another, I say go another 15 minutes. What were you thinking about doing? What, what okay. direction do you want to go? I've got some film of some zone and variations. They're not drawn up, but they're film. Or I got a document camera that I've got set up here where I can draw some things up and then show some film for a couple minutes. Uh, why don't you jump? To, why, why don't you? I'd love to see you draw some stuff up, Coach. I love your energy. Um, I think I want to get you on another one of these. Um, why don't you go ahead and draw some stuff up real quick and then just kind of show us a little bit and then we'll go from there and then uh, get out of here. Can you all see this screen now? Yep. The paper, the snowboard paper? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so for us, we work um, – inside zones where we start everything, mostly because when we block things like power, we use terms like zone away as the rule. Um, I know that guys that block power do it a bunch of different ways. I know that guys that block dart do it a bunch of different ways. But we run inside zone out, uh, stretch, power, and dart. And we, that's pretty much our four runs – uh, with variations, obviously, that go with them. So if we were running the zone, quite simply, I know this, like, it sounds ridiculously simple, but it is. I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the bottom line. It's what we want it to be. But we are literally responsible for what are in each of our fat tracks, our elephant tracks, going at a 45. This would be our zone to the right. We tell everything and try to make everything for our offensive line as, po as, as easy as possible. These guys are the unathletic ones that have to block dudes that are pretty Freaking breathing snot, breathing down their neck, freaking six foot three, 300 pounds and run a four, six, 40. Like these are the dudes from Alabama. They have to block every game down. Um, we believe that if you move uh, threes and ones, anything in this box, if you can move those guys, then we've got successful plays. No matter what it is, we're moving. We're, we're running. We don't talk a lot about blocking those guys because what will happen is if I'm responsible for this zone or let's say this zone or even better yet, this zone, who's blocking that cat? If you teach four hands, four eyes, this is my argument, and I know there are guys who are successful doing it. But if I teach four hands, four eyes, who's blocking this backer who's in both zones? Or when he moves? Because when we draw this on paper, it all makes everybody feel good. But when this sucker runs this stunt, which we saw last night, a damn safety's coming from here and they're widened out, where the hell do you go then? If you're blocking – to me, that's blocking a man. So if my nose – my face chases that guy instead of staying in my zone. I'm not blocking zone anymore. I'm working man concepts. And as soon as they stunt or twist a dude, we're in trouble. So we work zones. We work 45 degree angles and it does not matter who's in them. Like I said before, if they lined all 11 dudes up in this gap, it wouldn't be very sound. But if they did, he knows he's got 11 bags of bread to get to his mama. Uh, so when we do that and we work it together, if he's in this zone, he's in the bread. When he punch drags, He's going to punch that inside number or punch in it. I don't want to say slow, but in a short way. So he's going to shorten this up. He's going to drag him with him. And then we're going to continue on our 45. That becomes a double team. That should, if you do it right, cut that guy off or make him make a decision. We make him make a decision when he gets to those places. He can make a cut. It's when we're not there that it costs us issues. When we teach the Zach set, um, the zone blocking will go, let's say we're going zone uh, left. That's going to be odd for us. That means these guys, the play is actually going to go a lot like Veer. It's going to go this direction. So we're going to get to the center, try to make the cut off the O-line's butt. When we get to the butt, ride the wave of whatever has happened in here. Hopefully we have gotten movement at least to this level, and then he should get there and bend it off. Is really more realistic what it would look like. Quarterback's taking steps in toward the line like we're running triple. I grew up. Um, playing football for Emory Ballard and being a student of the game, the wishbone from the inventor himself. And so we have a lot of those principles. Our quarterbacks take steps a lot like our linemen do. One step, two step, and then all the way through the read. 
they're going to read what we call, we define it as the C-gap space, mostly because people move. Um, none of those defensive guys are dumb. They don't just sit there and stay in the same spot all the time. They're going to teach this guy to slow play. They're going to teach this guy to take the back immediately. They're going to teach this guy to come up the field and box us in or come up the field and race up the field. So we're going to teach him to, to, to read this C-gap space, not a defender. Because, again, if you get this look and you read that in and gave the football, that backer's going to smoke us in the face when we give the ball away, and that ain't any good. If they switch it like that and he comes underneath to chase the back, we should then pull it and this cat is in pitch phase. He can be in pitch phase from here. He can be in pitch phase from here. Same side, turn, look at him, get out to pitch phase, or he can be in pitch phase all the way from the back side. Again, hit the five by one, meaning five yards width, one yard back. That's what we're looking for in terms of his pitch phase. <clears throat> That's a base teaching. We will teach it as a triple to begin with. So zone with the back, pitch phase for the A. The A might be the guy who's running the zone and the B being pitch phase. Just depends on who your personnel is. That's how we teach it as a base. So we could literally be in four different, three different, one, two, three, four, five. Any of our formations we can run the zone in. But in terms of tripling, last year even, we tripled it with the tight end. So we put the B here. We zoned it off. We see gap read this space, and he backed up. Looking at the looking at the quarterback while we ran the zone here, came across and went to pitch phase here. Questions there? I know that's crazy, but it's the truth. So we will run it out of doubles and do it a different way. Doubles for us is it's twins both sides. Um, we will run it out of split, which is that two back set that we talked about what we call trump and slot, and it doesn't matter which side those guys are on. So we, the, the same play can get run out of multiple formations. I'll draw a few up for you. One might be slot. Okay. And the back lines up according to uh, how we call the play. So if we called, in this case, this would be zebra for us. Uh, animals are our, our zone, uh, I mean, our run plays. So this would be zebra odd or zebra 55. And he would run the zone. And we tell him again, it's gonna, the play's going to end up over here, but the line is blocking left. That's why we call it 55. We get it all on the screen here. He would back up again, looking at the quarterback so he can get accurately to five by one, run, this, uh, run his steps here, attacking what he's already read. And then he's going to come to the next defender, whoever that is, is his pitch key. Uh, we could run it. Out of Trump, you put the Z on the other side. So this would be slot for us. This would be Trump for us. And those are both right. We always tell the A where to go because he's the guy that's got to be, uh, he's, he's got the difficult job. If we were going odd, it could be like this. Again, again, you can crack these. You can uh, crack arc this scheme however you want to get. And then that guy would be, whatever's left would be your pitch key. Um, we go from... Here, uh, we can go to the back. Same formations. This would be run the same play. And the A basically knows this because his default, if he is connected to the box, is to be pitch phase. Get there however he's got to get there. He knows that he's going to pitch phase to the side of the B. Uh, so that would be, uh, this would be left, and then this would be Trump left. And again, see again, pitch, pitch key. Questions there. And all of that, along with a number of others, is that. So all of these is that. That's what the line would hear. Questions there? That's a ton in like no time, but gives you an idea of some things that we do. Other things that we do, uh, we'll call uh, a slice on these. So let's say quarterback's having a difficult time or we just want to shove it up in there in the goal line. Um, we'll get in one of our H-back sets and we'll bring that cat across. Split zone, some folks call it. And there is no read on this, although we have done it where I've had Houdini last year, last. Two years prior, 
Um, I had a guy who was just fantastic at reading things. We were facing some odd fronts and wanted to give him something different. So he read this outside backer, which is actually the number two guy. So we're slicing this cat who stayed back here um, because we would run some power to the front side of this. So they would play it this way in an odd front. We'd slice to this. If this guy tried to play CBA too quick, then I let the quarterback pull the rock. Um, but that's not, that's not often that that happens. Usually this is a layup. I'm going to give the ball right here. We're going to block this zone. And he's going to try to – really what happens is – He's going to hit this crease if we can create it here. And if not, he might bounce it all the way back. But I try to get him to go no further than that. And sign it where there might be an open space depending on what the defensive uh, split is. We can do um, we call knife, which is the same thing the other direction. So we would be here, and we might put ourselves in a slot left. And he's going to just J-block that as if he's blocking power. The back is here, and again, he's running zone in the back crease. It should give, but we do sometimes, like I said, give him the option to do that if he's just that good a quarterback at reading things. Um, and then we do a couple of other things. We will do what we call uh, sword. I don't like having this many names for the same thing, essentially. Start telling kids certain things. They mean certain things. So, for instance, if you called this slice, then he's going to go across that formation no matter what it is you're doing. So when we come to run this, and all I want him to do is hook this cat, and it, it, anyway, they get it confused. So we would do this. We still read this C space double option type scenario. And now we're and then the other thing that we can do is off of the slice, we can go zone this direction. And as he's going this direction, instead of slicing the guy, he can go around him, get to the same placement that he was here. And so now you're reading this C gap space and we're logging into that cat. Uh, quarterback is now reading that C-gap space, taking his steps, and if he pulls it, he's got a lead blocker to that cat. That's a variation. So there's those, those variations. And just for sake of not going long, I'll show a couple more, and then we'll show a little bit of film. Um, so we run, uh, for us, is, is doubles. We try to triple out of everything that we have or, or have the ability to do so. Let's put it that way. Can y'all see the screen? I keep putting this thing over too far. Yeah, okay. Good. So pre-snap, if we get, okay, if we get, say, we call this an uncovered look. So we are pre-snap RPO most of the time, although the guy we have right now is really good at regular RPO, so we've run a lot more of that this year than we have in the past. Let's say we're getting this kind of look, and he's got leverage now, and that guy is off six yards or more, even though he doesn't have to be. Um, he could be on him, and we'd still run this as long as we got leverage here. This is the uncovered guy. This is what we call our shellfish game. So we would tag. Um, let's say we're going – so this would be zebra 55 like we drew up earlier. So you're going to get this from the line. That's all they're going to hear. Uh, your back is going to run the zone unless all we do is reach over to him and say like a little noise to him. That tells him, hey, I'm throwing this because they're uncovered. If that's the case, he's going to race off the edge and block the first thing off the tackle's edge so we don't get smoked in the face. And he's going to throw what we call crawfish. If we call crawfish, they crawfish to both sides. We block the first threat, block the first threat. We want to work wide first, make them make us cut, which means he's got to step over in front of us for us to cut anything back here. That's what we would like to see happen. We have had guys who run five flat 40s playing in that spot, gain 13 yards a shot just running crawfish with a blocker there. Um, it's ridiculous. Well, we call it crawfish because the way we run it, it looks like we're a crawfish. We're literally backing up with as long a steps as we can in a backpedal. It gives us the best target from the quarterback. It's the most effective for us. Some folks run the crap out of some bubbles. I don't have that accurate in a quarterback. Uh, or maybe I do, but it's still easier to do this and still get outside leverage than it is to run the bubble and be right in terms of where we're throwing it all the time, at least in my, in my experience. So we don't change that. Um, that would be crawfish. If we wanted to run it to the outside guy who was also uncovered, we would just switch the blocker. He steps up three really short steps, comes back to his original position. Again, he's going to tell the back that he's going to throw that ball before. And the rest of them are just going to still run the play, except for this back. He's going to turn his feet and throw the ball right now. There's no put the ball down and read it and throw it, although we have tripled it sometimes that way. But again, that depends on the ability of the quarterback. Um, we still find that if you do it uncovered, make the decision in. Trying to get outside, make them make you cut in order to cut anything back. 
across the grain. That's our shellfish game is crawfish, oyster. And then if we wanted to play act or not play action, we want to double move off of those, we would go lobster. What's a big crawfish? A lobster. So we just give him the double signal. So he's going to fake the block, run vertical. He's going to run the crawfish, always viable. So if they decided to cover that, he could still check this down. And then what's a great uh, oyster, if you leave it long enough, becomes a pearl. So pearl is the other one, which would be uh, fake the oyster here and run at that first defender with our hands as hard as we can, take his inside shoulder up the crease. We're going to pump this and throw this. Any questions there? No, the only question we have so far is if you had a couple uh, zone blocking drills that you have. So there's, okay, yeah, so there is, um, so we got the five lines. When we, when we go to block the zone blocking stuff, we go, uh, we go, this is what we call our goal line drills. So literally, we will line up uh, defensive dudes and offensive dudes, right, all the way down the line. And again, you can coach 40 guys, one drill, and see a lot of what's wrong and what's right without having to be individualized and have freaking 30 guys standing around and two guys drilling. That sucks. Don't do that. It's a bad thing. It wastes time. Waste. Um, they're not going to learn from watching somebody else do it. They need to do it. And then you need to spend time. Like, for instance, this might be the JV -ish side or even you might have your, your varsity type guys here. And your JV or guys, they might be out there. Does that make sense? And you want right side players. And I, I would go into explanation of this, but I'm not sure if we got time, so we'll see. But And you have left side players, but when you go pass protection drills, it's easier to get. So, and I say right side players, that means centers and right guards and right tackles are all this way. Left guards, left tackles are all over here. Um, it doesn't really matter that you have a defensive guy or not over there. It's going to be the other dude. It doesn't matter who he is um, on the other side. We're going to line him up six inches from our helmet in the neutral zone because we're trying to reiterate the fact that we're going to take two steps before he touches us um, and punch our guns, cock guns and punch. Remember the titty holsters and firing in the jet plane takeoff. So we would take that defender, put him on the right side. Say we're going zone right, right? We're going to work at that guy with two steps. And we're going to get to what we call a two-step fit. Perfect fit if you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Your both hands are going to fit into his either sides of his breastplate. Um, and your hips are still going to be down, ready to coil on that second step, but we're not quite coiling. We don't get, want to get standing up. We want to stay flat back. Our face wants to be in the middle chest. If they had shoestrings, they don't even have them anymore on, sh on shoulder pads, but that's where we would want our face mask, our hands on his breastplate, our back flat, our hips still coiled, ready to explode. That's getting to a two-step fit is what we're looking for. So we call this drill two-step fit. Now, it may be zone two-step fit, or it could be past two-step fit, um, it just depends on what we're doing. So for the ends, for the purposes of zone, that's what we're doing. Then we'll take the defender, put him on this side, still going zone right, and we will work the punch drag for PD two-step fit. Which means now I'm going to do the same thing, run the exact same play, but now I don't have anybody in red. I'm working cheeseburger. So that's this cat on the back side. Now we try to reiterate this by making him really tight, and again, six inches from the ball. And then we're going to punch, but we're not going to punch with an extension. Um, it's hard to do this when I'm drawing it. And I'm, I want to show the drill, but I want to show – can you all see me? Yeah. So when I'm punching, this cat's over here. That's great. That's easy. That's a base block. When he's on my backside, I don't want to punch and extend to make an arm bar. Then I've just created a crease for him to create to, – to come to me or to, make, to beat us. So when we punch, I'm actually going to sit in this right here. I'm going to same same motion. This one might punch and coil. This one's going to sit. And all I'm doing is trusting my teammate that he's going to take care of his bread because if he does, he's going to push him into my punch drag. So I'm here. I'm punching for whatever cloth I can get at that point, and I'm going to take those steps here and punch, and I'm going to get fitted, and he's going to be real tight. We tell the defender to attack the V of the neck. That's what they're taught anyway. So if he's on the backside of us, he could very well be attacking our V of the neck, or he could be attacking our backside guy. But we're going to trust he's going to push him. And most of the time, because we take those 45-degree steps and short, quick ones, the worst-case scenario 
scenario we're going to get is that guy's going to get laterally moved. He may not get moved 45, but he'll get laterally moved. If he gets laterally moved, he gets pushed into our punch drag. Now we have two guys with hips going the same direction. So the, the point of guys that teach forehands for eyes is to take the hips of the center and or whoever it is, the two guys that are double teaming, get their hips together so that that hip power can be working uh, together. If they do this, they ain't going to go anywhere because they're working against each other. So you have to overcome that problem when you're teaching forehands for eyes. Secondly, uh, so, so that's what they're trying to create. Well, if we all go at 45, what do we just do? We created the same hip motion going the same direction without having to pinball to figure out who the hell it is I'm blocking if I'm going four hands, four eyes. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I, and I realize I'm talking to some guys who are believers in four hands, four eyes. You guys are awesome. Keep teaching it because I know you're saving success. But I haven't been fortunate enough to have – I had one line that was phenomenal, and all of them could have been D1 at any one point in time. One year, I may never have it again. But they did what we do now, and it was effective. We were really good, and we were undefeated through a regular season, and they bought into each other and all that other kind of stuff. But the bottom line is they both work. If you believe in it enough and you're passionate enough about what it is you're teaching, you tie it, it'll work. Um, so anyway, we believe that those hips will now go together. This way, I'm going to punch drag. We're going to take this with us. And the force of the guy on the backside now moves him into the double team that we didn't ever have to talk about. We didn't have to. We believe in each other. We work things as a team. But when we're drilling individually, that guy who's individually – not as good as the next guy, doesn't have to worry about whether or not he can beat a guy that's better than him. He's just got to do his job. If I can make it to where he's just got to do his job to see success, then there are times where that guy that's 5'9", 197, is going to be blocking with a guy who may be 6'4", 280. They're doing it together. His force doesn't have to be exactly the same to get the movement that we want. And maybe they pancake that guy and he gets the feeling of a pancake on a guy that's 260 on the other side of him without having to do it himself, but he doesn't know the difference. He's only worried about what his technique is. Um, and it works. Like, they still move. They still get out of the way. They still move in places that we want them to move. So we work that punch drag two-step fit drill. Then we will fit and drive. So um, – On the fit and drive, we do the same two drills, um, but then we're trying to drive out, and we don't want to come out of that jet plane takeoff until we get the, uh, the line of scrimmage reestablished two yards from where it started, which is the origin, uh, the origin of the play in the first place, is that if we can reestablish the line of scrimmage two yards from where it started, if we can fall forward, we're going to gain three and a half every play. If we get that, we're satisfied. Obviously, we're going to ask for more, but we're going to do – I'm good with three and a half. Three and a half gets me a first down in three plays every time I go all the way down the field. Um, so we're looking at – once we get to two yards, then we can start our, ex, our ascent. We can be – if we're in good position, which we've already worked to get perfect fit, we've fitted, we're underneath their shoulder pads, we're going to lift that breastplate and try to shove it in their, uh, in their Adam's apple. That stands that guy up 100% of the time. He will stand up, and then we can run. Now we can get into comfortable mode where I'm finishing a block way down the field, if that makes sense. Um, so that's fit and drive. We only do it for about two yards and then let the, let the, the plan roll off. So we don't take away pancakes, but we also aren't pancaking defenders every damn time we turn around. Um, I have never been, uh, I've never been fortunate enough to be at a place where we had time to get a GA or somebody, I don't know, to get a mattress out and put it with guys who work on pancakes, which is great. I don't, I don't discard the practice. I just don't have the time or the resources to try to do it, so we don't do it. Anyway, we'll do that with, um, with the front side and bread in terms of fit and drive, but then we will also take now two guys. I'll tell this defender to line up again six inches from wherever, and I will tell him to attack whichever via the neck he chooses. It does not matter to me. Or I will point it in that direction. So I'll point this direction so all defenders now are working this way. That means he should end up uh, punch dragging this. He should end up breading this, and they should end up working together. Or then he'll come back at the V of the neck here. He may not be able to get punch dragged in, but he's got to dig his feet in and not go fast to a linebacker in case this guy screws it up and we get a one-on-one -on -one base block on this scenario. But we work the double team both sides, and then we'll go the other direction and tell him to do the same thing. Um, and that's, um, that's just working uh, big zones is what we call it. That's our big zones drill. So when we go goal line drills, the, maybe the most important thing we do is the soloed up, guy on the backside, punch drag drill. 
um, when we put them together, they get to work together with all different kinds of guys. This drill is really important. Um, and then we'll put him on the other side too. We'll go here for each of those guys. Um, obviously, we can't do all of these drills every day. This is one of those things where we try to find out who the guys are that are needing the most work. Are the tackles needing it this way? Um, are the guards and centers having the most difficulty? Whatever it is. And then we'll direct those, those defenders to those positions. So in this case, we'd be facing an odd front probably. This would be our right tackle. And he gets to work the hardest block that there is, which is there's a four technique. I'm running zone this direction. He's running zone as well. And this guy comes underneath. If I put my two hands on that guy every, every time 100% I'm going to turn my shoulders facing this way now, what's the problem with that? Now I'm pushing the guy back into the play. I'm not um, – I'm working against the momentum that we have when our hips are working together, pushing him this way, and I'll never pick up leg. Make sense? So that's why we move him those different directions. Um, we also do that, put him there, run the drill going this way so that – Again, if this is the right tackle, if this guy tries to cross my face, I can take him with me into the tracks. Um, or if he comes off on my butt, I can tell the difference, and I don't just get washed into the guard and create uh, no space in the bad read for our quarterbacks. So we sit strong in this 45-degree angle. Does that answer some of those questions with some of those drills? Yeah, that was huge. I, I know. I, I love that part. That was great. Um, the best thing about it, like I said, is you can have all the defense linemen and those defense linemen get to work attacking the V of the neck. I don't want them to screw up or lose their technique sometimes from six inches so that we have to really work at getting both feet in the ground. Um, and inevitably what you're going to find is the kids don't trust it at first. They'll just they'll almost power clean themselves into two hands fitting on the guy and they never move their feet. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to work that thing. If you work it in a sled, you can work it in a sled. The sled doesn't move at you, but you can align your offensive guy really close and force him to get both feet down before he punches that sled. Um, they can do it. They just have to know that it's, it's a heartbeat sound. It's boom. That's, that's the sound their feet should make when they take steps. Ba boom. It's not a hop. It's not one step in the ground and then big, long lunge. You're not strong in the lunge. Otherwise, people would lunge for world records when they're squatting. They squat with two feet on the ground. So as quickly as you can get two feet in the ground, the better. Um, the shorter your steps and the quicker they are, the better. The only time that long is good is if you've got his momentum moving in the direction you want. Then you just need to sprint because you block with feet. Um, um, who was it earlier? Coach Bacon. Coach Bacon yeah. was talking about it earlier. Our kids want to block with hands because it's lazy and they think it's easy easy um so it's it's critically important that they for our guys we teach them all the time that they 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 need to do wall sits when they start camp at home uh, 10 sets of 30 seconds sit a wall sit parallel they oh, and it, it doesn't do anything except strengthen their legs and their core uh, their core hips which they have to be able to do to do anything on the offensive line effectively the way we teach it and what for what we're looking for um and to be strong in those positions um, one of the other things we'll do on the fit and drive is we'll do fit and control. So we'll actually fit them up in the two-step fit position. We'll start there, not in the stance. We'll start from the perfect position, you know, face mask, helmet, and, and, and uh, hands are in the breastplate. We'll sit really, really low. The defender's low as well, but really I want the defender to try to shake us. So he's going to grab hold of our shoulder pads, and he's going to try to direct our path one direction or the other. And our job is – to sit in our hips and control with a wide base the direction of that defender and make it go 45 and not get turned, forcing him one direction or the other. It's, it's not a drill that necessarily is realistic to a game all the time because those guys are freaking strong, but it does force you to sit strong in your hips long enough that if you were in a position that way where they were trying to get off of you, your push would drive you toward the defender. And so if he does go direction, I'm still connected. And by that time, if you're connected that well, we just want you to finish the guy anyway, wherever he wants to go. Um, the premise behind that is if you're back and you can see the blocker in front of you and he's connected to the defender, you have a great chance of making a big, a big play as a running back. If he is not connected to the defender, but he's going towards him, you don't know for sure which direction he's going to take or which direction the defender is going to pick. So if you pick one, that defender can then bounce himself into that position. Now you're tackled. 
Whereas if I'm connected to you, there's nothing you can do that's going to make the decision right. If you even guess as a defender, let's say you can see the back, which you shouldn't be able to if I'm connected. If you can see the back, the back goes this way and you go that direction. Because I'm connected, I can pancake you while we're running by you. That's what we want. That's what we want is connections. So, um, Coach, I don't know if you got time for film or not, so it's up to you. So, Coach, that was awesome. I, I don't mind. I don't care if the other guys want to stay on. Go ahead and fit, go ahead and bust out some film, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. That was awesome. I appreciate that. That okay. those drops were awesome. No, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's it's uh, it's what we do. Um, so okay, so real quick, we'll look at some of these variations. So um, on this one. Um, we're going to RPO this actually. So we're going to run what we call file for us. Uh, our RPOs all base off of our quick game. So one is hitches, two is slants, three is slant flat, and four is fade flat. So fade flat is files with an F. So it's toolbox. So we would go zebra even. So your line's going to block this direction, right? We're going to run the zone with the back. If we're filing, this is full-blown RPO, so we're longer uncovered RPO. We're going to triple it all the way and the whole thing. We're going to read the flat defender and throw off of whatever shows as the next thing. So we're going to run a flat here. We're going to run a fade here. And he's it's really quad option if you want to get down to it because he's allowed to throw any of these things once he has made the double option choice here to pull the football. So let's see what he does. Boom, reads, pulls, run, see you later. Executed very well. See it from the wide. Again, seven-man box, and we're running the football. There's your C-gap defender. Probably could have given it and gained plenty of yards. Don't like where the back hit the crease, but at least he was behind the line. But that was a great read by the quarterback and the C-gap. Again, this is C-gap space. So if you go back to triple option rules, if you're facing an odd front, oh, this is even front, so it doesn't matter. But um, this is, they play two stand-up ends. So even front, this is pretty pretty uh, sta uh, straightforward, your C-gap defender. So he's going to read it. He squeezes there. We can beat him. And I don't give, so some guys teach a lot of different things. Some guys teach if he turns to face the back. Some guys teach he's got to chase the back. Some guys teach if he shows you his chest, then that's what tells you to pull it or not or whatever. I tell him if you can beat him, beat him. But if you're wrong, I'm going to stick my foot off in your ear. So that's it. So he's now, now, now we'll say this when we're teaching the quarterback, we teach him to ride from the back hip to the front hip. If he does not ride the, that ball from his back hip to his front hip, if he gets it right and guesses, he's still wrong. So it would be a negative and gravy film if he didn't take that ball all the way to the front hip. Even if the guy has made his choice to take the back early in the ride, so he's back hip going to the front hip and he only gets to here, that's when that guy has made his choice. If he pulls it then, he's wrong. He's got to ride it the whole way every time so it's the same every time so that that defender doesn't get a beat on when you're going to pull the football or not. Hey, Coach, it's, yes, the video is really choppy. So by the time you <laughs> say slow something, down. yeah, if you sure. just, yeah, run it slower. Let me go this way then. You want to see the wide? Yeah. Here's the wide. Okay, I'm going slow-mo. C-gap defender, four-man front. C-gap space. He tries to slow play it. See that? Scooting down the line? Yeah, that's better. And then, so he's going to pull it because I tell him he can beat him. He beats him. And they went man coverage on this backside, so they're covering fades and flats. And uh, too busy. we're too busy pulling the ball. On him. Safety was on the wide side of the field. So look at it from the end zone. Same thing. Same play, I mean. There they are in their zero coverage. There's our steps. Pull the football on that cat and beat him. There in man coverage, we're going. Y'all see that better? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Better. All right. Yeah. So let's see what we got here. Uh, since we just saw that, I'm going to try to get us to something, to, another variation. All right, here we go. So here's other shellfish. So this is a pre-snap uncovered. Okay. So pre-snap uncovered. Let's go to wide. Okay. So he's going to decide. This is freaking seven yards. I'll take that all day. This is seven yards. I'll take that all day. So pre-snap, he should decide here or here. Notice he'll look at the back. And the thing about me telling you this, like even if guys are playing us, he's looking at him. Sometimes he's telling the back, hey, we're going to run the zone. Or, hey, we're going to do the other. So you don't know what he's telling him, and it's not a code word. So 
they don't know what he's saying. So on film, guys will look at him and go, oh, look at him, he's looking at him. Yeah, but sometimes we run his own, he does it, and sometimes he throws the ball. So it really doesn't give anything away. All right, so he decided he's going to look over the back. Hey, I'm going to throw this ball real quick. Or not, or he's going to run it. We'll see what he decides. Okay, he decides to run it. Why? They're in coverage for where they are. I don't know why, to be honest with you. I think he should have, get, I think he should have thrown the ball, but he makes a good decision, pulls and gets in the crease. Whoop, he cuts one too many times for me. I get on him about this, too, because – you go back, we'll watch this on the end zone and watch how stupid he looks. Run the zone. Okay, I'm going to run the zone. Takes his step, lateral step, down, crossover downhill. He pulls a rock. Now tell me, who the hell you out running if you get to this point? Just beat that guy. Tell your level. You should have kept running straight. But sometimes when you got good quarterbacks to do great things, you put them in too much of a box. You disallow some things that are really good for your team. Um, okay, so here's another. I don't know if this is wide. I think wide's bigger than this. There we go. All right, so here's another variation. So here now we go fake the crawfish in the, in the shellfish game, and then we're going to throw the big ball. So here we go. Now the back did the signal. He didn't, shouldn't have needed it. But there we go. Fake the crawfish, throw the fade ball. Big play. What should have happened is, oh, sorry. What should have happened is this back should have gone off of this edge, um, but he didn't do it. Sometimes this back gets under my nerves, on my nerves, excuse me, under my skin. Um, this is last year. This is also that very, the same variation real quick, uh, and this will be a better sell. Watch the cell on the crawfish right here, which we work every day in a drill that takes about three minutes. We work all four of these options, the crawfish, the lobster, the oyster, and the pearl. We work it in about three minutes, and we get a bazillion. We get four perfect reps in a row. If they're not in a row, we start it over. Sometimes the drill takes five. At the beginning of the year, it can take 15. But we're going to get those four reps in a row where it's perfect both sides. And what we do is we put a quarterback here, a quarterback there. We throw both sides. They run the crawfish. This guy blocks his butt off. Um, over there, if, he, if we go on an air, he's blocking hard for five yards with his hands out like he's blocking it. It's got to be a sprint. If he jogs off the ball, that rep doesn't count. We start over and he gets pushed. Um, I'm a big stickler for tucking the football. And we do, we go with by way of Tiki Barber where we are going to, if our fingers are on our face mask, it's right. Anything else is wrong. If they don't do that, the reminder is three push ups. I'm not trying to punish them, I'm just trying to get them to understand that the most important thing on the field is the ball. I'm sorry. Let's try this again. <clears throat> so there's the correct job by the running back. Pump, great fake on the crawfish, and we're wide open. Tremendous fake on the crawfish, and we work that. If the crawfish fake sucks, that's another one of those things that when we're working perfect reps, um, we want it to be better. Here's a formation change for us. So here's a – this is one that's really easy. It's inexpensive for what it pays off to be. The formation alone is, is worth doing it, I think, the way that we do it. So here, if we want to switch two people in a formation, we just call it flop. So all we did was our normal trio, which is trips open. Um, this would be trio right if that outside guy was out here and then he was off the ball inside. Well, when we go flop – he moves in. He's now the inside position guy. He's the outside position guy. So he's playing Z. He's playing Y. But when we run pass routes, or in this instance, we're going to run our file tag, which file for three man should be fade, hole, and flat. Hole is an eight yard hitch. Um, so we should have a fade route out here. We should have a hole route at eight yards. And we should have a flat from here. So this, again, that's fade. So that's where we go. If we were in trio, now because we're in flop, He's going to go where he would go. He's normally the fade ball guy. So instead of us teaching guys uh, first position, second position, third position, if you're the Y, this is what you do. If you're the Z, this is what you do. And then we, by formation, change what that looks like, and we work the variations. So he's going to run a fade from here, which means he's going to get out to those numbers, and then he's going to fade it up from there. He's going to cross it now, and it looks a lot like snag. 
from a hole position, and then he's going to go to the flat. So it looks like something totally different, and all we did was switch the formation, which to me is much easier than, okay, what's the one position do? Because now i got to learn all three positions for how many plays you got. And instead, I can run the same play, but because of formation, I can change the look for the defense. So here we go. This is uh, RPO, full RPO, but it's a three-man side file instead of the, the two-man side like you saw score earlier. Notice where they're going. He comes out, pulls. Probably should have run, but that guy comes to take me. There's my whole route or fade route. He had everybody open. Everybody see that? So he's got great width right here, which is going to make him open. He's got great position right here, which is going to make him open. And the guy that, should have picked, that was playing safety is in no man's land. Should he take the hole? Should he take me? He doesn't take either in the corner. He's got his eyes caught in the backfield. Touchdown. Well, should be touchdown. Yeah. Okay, let's see if we can get to one other. Here's a sword. Okay, so we used a little bit of motion. We used more motion this year maybe than we've used um, in all our years, in all my years here, maybe in all my years, period. Um, it was to gain some advantages with what people did. Uh, so sword means, we, we talked about this earlier, we're going to run zone this direction. You can tell because that's where the back is. The A is going to move over. Axe is just a motion to get him across the formation. And then he's going to arc release this. We're going to read the C gap. <laughs> and if we pull it, we've got a lead blocker. So here we go. There's our motion guy. He gets lined up. Run the zone away. Arc release. He didn't really arc release to the guy he's supposed to. Actually, he didn't even block anybody. He screwed it up. That's even better. This little guy's got some boogie. It's our sophomore kid. It's a backup quarterback. It's only a touchdown he scored all year. Do reverse pass for a touchdown earlier in the game, actually. Um, okay, so let's go to another one. There's files. We've seen that. Here's a slice variation. So this is the uh, – we're running this play, and it's a give. There's no, there's no uh, read to this. This should be a give all the way. We come across. Terrible leverage. He really shouldn't have that, – that's really not a good ball. But, hell, he's going to gain all these yards on his own. <laughs> you know it's good clinic talk when they give you the stuff that sucks. This was not very good. <clears throat> what did happen on that? Let's look at it from the end zone. What should happen on this is come on, video. It's not liking me right now. There we go. What should happen is he should attack that inside out, kick that, and you'd see the crease. For some reason, I'm not getting the end zone view. Oh, here we go. What should happen is we should zone this out, and if he'll take a great angle inside out and kick that right there, you'll see the hole be bigger than Christmas. Bang. So worst case scenario, we're coming off of the butt of that tackle right there. If this guy's over pursuing on his gap exchange, we've kicked it out. And there's a crease. And that's what you're looking for in that play. I want to get to one more thing for sure. Here's the slice, same side. Okay, so now we're going to run zone this direction. And he's going to J block this like it's power. Again, we just teach it as zone. Some guys call it a completely different play. We don't. There's the turnout. There's the crease. Not a great job by the left tackle who's back up, but nonetheless, not a bad job by the guy running the football. And he's not supposed to pull this either. So, again, screw up for touchdown ain't bad. So he gets the nice job. Don't ever do that again on the sideline speech. There we go. This is the fun stuff for me. Um, so we're going to be in what we call our – this is our tackle over sets. So now all we do to tackle over is we actually guard over, but we call it tack because it's easier to call. So we take the right guard and we move him over and he just goes to the other side of the center. What this allows us to do is a couple of things. One, you displace people one man this direction. So if I was on this side, this hash, 
I now have moved the whole formation three feet this direction toward the middle of the field, which does not seem like a lot of space, but it's a buttload of space when you want to run stuff back into the boundary as opposed to the field. So we tackle this over and we'll do a number of things. When you tack over, most people think that you're just mentally, they think you're going to run to the tackled side. You're trying to gain leverage, which there's some validity to that. But for us, the great thing about this formation or this adjustment to our formations is that we can do it to any of our formations <clears throat> and, and we can run the dart to either side. Here's why. When we run the dart, I know this is a zone deal, but I'm telling you why the, this is why the zone is so important to us other than the variations of zone is that if we were running the dart, we could run the dart to either side. It would not matter. Uh, if we ran it to this side, he would kick this out. The rules for the three interior guys are to zone away. Or if you have a front side technique or a four man front, like they're going to give us here, he's going to block the technique. So if he's inside, he's going to close him off inside, run and zone away. If he's outside, he is going to inset and kick him out, just like we're doing with the tackle. So if he's outside, that's what he's doing. These two are zoning away to what's there. That should pick up those two cats, nose and backside linebacker. If they're doing it right, you should get a punch drag from him. You should get a bread from the center. And then we're going to pull this up into whatever hole it is to the linebacker that is on the front side. And our A, no matter what side he's on, is going to arc release to the next thing. So we've just blocked seven dudes. We've run double option where he can get up in the crease that's a safe block on the front side or – if he reads outside backer, even though we're blocking him, if he reads the outside backer, squeezes in at all, he can then pull this ball, follow him with a lead blocker. So we can run the dart in this tackle formation to either side. Here's the thing. We can run it back to the other side as well because the rules apply the same. Now, you got to get some work with these guys tacked to that side, but it's still good. He would kick this out. He's going to zone away, zone away, zone away. There's your puller. He's going to still arc release so that the front side is safe. So even if this cat was going to CBA and try to squeeze in here, <clears throat> we still got him. And then again, we would read outside back or C gap space. And how do we control the rest of it? You can run your crawfish game with this still, uh, your pre-snap uh, RPO, or you can go block this guy. He's blocked already. So you used another guy just like this to block the extra man. So if he does put the back, we're here. And he runs the dart. He's in the safe zone. If he pulls the football, he's got a blocker out here. So you're pretty much taken care of all the way across the board. And however they want to play this, as if you are unbalanced, um, you still can balance the formation up and go to their weakness. So, But this in the zone, we're going to run the zone. And we are going to um, – it says why. I'm not exactly sure what we run on this, to be honest with you. Oh, well, the tackle is not very good on this. It looks like it's just regular old zone. Awesome. So we're going to get short pitch phase. You'll see the same side pitch phase out of this really fat A back that we have last year. So here we go. We're going to run the zone away. There it is. Tackle doesn't do a great job, but he goes underneath, pull the ball, pitch the ball to the fat kid. There you go. Triple option. Just running zone. And the fat kid gains how many yards? That's a lot of yards. I don't know if he's ever run that far in his life. Anyway, that may have been the only time he did it. Um, and you can see it from the end zone. There we go. Oh, that's going to be the film. That's okay. Um, again, this is that tough job by the left tackle here um, that we talked about early. He didn't, he didn't do this because look at his left hand. It's on the defender, so he didn't do what he's supposed to do, which is outblock this. He's too high, but that was normal because he was a little bit out of shape. Here's our right guard who has moved over to that centered position. There's our center who was strong as an ox, so he didn't have great pad level most of the time. Here's our tackle who will come up with a freshman excuse as to why he didn't come off the ball correctly. But there's your C-gap defender. Does he take the back? Yes, so we pull it. Here's your pitch key guy, and the closest thing to the guy in the pitch phase is now the safety. If you do it right, which he does, attack the outside shoulder. There's your dish, and now we're running. All right, man, I really appreciate it. It's an honor to speak to you guys, and I'll do it whenever you, uh, whenever we can make the time work. But um, I don't know if I put anything on here. I can do that real quick. Yeah, yeah, Coach. Put, chat, uh, if anybody's uh, got any questions or whatever. Put up your info. Um, that was awesome, man. Uh, we could dive into that all day long. Um, yeah, I could talk to you for a long time, man. Some people <laughs> – 
What's that? They look at me like I'm. I said I can talk zone all day long. It's a, it's a passion of mine, and it, and again, it, it's. I would say this to any of you, especially young guys, if you can marry whatever it is you're doing, and you've probably heard the saying that if you love it, then you'll never work a day in your life. That's awfully true. But if you're coaching, I would I would even go so far as to say, um, you know, Costa really uh, spoke to me earlier about um, what he was talking about, because we do a lot of those kinds of things where you're teaching young men how to be young men um, and better citizens and wrapping that all in what it is you're doing. Yep. For us, one of the sayings we have is that everything has a purpose, and that includes everything from the first step on the zone block to the scheme as a whole to how we would do push-ups when we finish a, a, a practice and why we face out as opposed to facing wherever you want to. Everything has a purpose. And if you're, if you're in coaching, it should be as a calling um, to make better people because I, I honestly believe that we're the last true line of defense for this country um, in being great. So appreciate it, man. That's a, that's a great point, Coach. I mean, we, we, we have the ability to reach hundreds of young men every year and create good young men, right? And there's a, yep. there's a guy I, I listened to, um, his name's Garrett White, and um, he talks about if you can create a good young man, then he in turn creates, he in turn creates a nice family, which, and creates a good community, which creates a good, you know, state, a good country, yep. and it just feeds, it's a big spider web, and I, and I think we are. One, that, one that double feeds is the entire flow of the river. Right, right. And I think that's the biggest thing that I want to do with this and, and get co coaches because I, I love the X's and O's and stuff. But when you guys start diving in deeper on, on, the, um, on the whys and how we can use these things to create good young men and the teaching tools and stuff, I think that's the purpose of the whole thing. And to help um, younger coaches and new coaches and coaches that are still trying to learn on how to relate to their kids better and, and help them um, create good young men. So Man, I really appreciate well, I think you. We kind of fold ourselves into where we are too. We kind of we kind of tend to like there's wing T parts of the country, or there's wing T parts of Texas. I can tell you that, or there's spread parts of Texas. So there's run and shoot parts of, of, of places that are. So we kind of get morphed into where it is we are. So it's right. good to this Zoom stuff. As much as like I like to try to find the positives in everything, and this COVID as bad as it is for folks who are dealing with the disease itself, has forced us into Zooms and. Google meets where we can talk to guys from the West coast right now or from the East coast or from the UK who are learning this game and what it is really about. And that's, that's pretty big. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's going to be a lot. It's, you know, this whole thing sucks, but there's a lot of good stuff that's going to come out. It's crazy. I read an article um, real quick. The last time we had something like this happen was during world war one um, Spanish flu, right? Like if we know our history at all, but um, in this article and it was talking about that, the NFL actually spurned out of that. There was, uh, it was a lot of just kind of regional teams that kind of had some, some connection and this and that. And then when the pandemic hit and they were just like, oh, we're shutting down here, but we're not here. And where they just kind of barnstormed it and kind of put it together. Well, when that all came out of that all came the original NFL, because they decided, Hey, if we're going to make this right, we've got to create something that, we have a commission and we have a, we have something that's, that's regulated and, and it's crazy to think that the NFL spurned out. So there's going to be a lot of good things that come out of this. And I think that being able to realize that the world is, is we can, we can still connect and, and not just with likes and, and this, I, I'm not a Facebook guy, but the whole, the, the likes and the comments and this, but actually have these conversations and, and connect coaches around the country. And we had some, we have a ton of people that did, there's like 30 people that couldn't make it tonight from the UK that are begging right. for this, this video. So there's going to be a lot of people even across the pond, they're going to get it. So I think this is going to be a start to something big, man. Really appreciate everybody. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate it. Good, good night. It's after 12 o'clock here. Hey, guys. <laughs> I know. Next time we'll do it earlier, I promise. <laughs> all right you guys um hey pay attention to the facebook um page and your emails because i'm going to be sending out the link to this video to everybody um and uh we'll be putting out about a bunch of more content out and doing another one hopefully within the next month so hopefully after christmas time i'll be looking forward thank you thanks coaches thank you